one of the ways in which we've done this in the past, or I've done this in the classroom, is to open up a book that um, is quite accessible to students. Um, one of those that I find is the Book of the Courtier by Castiglione. We have um, two versions of the text in the AOR um, corpus. One is actually the uh, Italian language version, which is also annotated by uh, Harvey. That can be a bit more of a stretch for some students. However, um, the, uh, this particular translation by Hobie um, is entirely in English. Uh, and as we learn from marginalia, very often the, the nature of the marginalia will um, reflect the nature of the language of the original anchor text. And so a lot of the marginalia are also in English. And because of Gabriel Harvey's particularly clear hand, um, this becomes um, a, a very manageable um, sort of thing. Uh, I have to keep moving the things around on my screen in order to get access. But um, one of the things that I've done in the past is to go all the way across to um, a summary of the attributes of a courtier, um, which appear uh, toward the end of the book. And I'm just trying to discover those. Um, I'm having, bear with me. It's YY3. Some of our um, pagination or foliation is a little more challenging than others. And then we open it to this page, a brief rehearsal um, of the chief conditions and qualities of a courtier. So here we have a wonderful example of a page and indeed a sequence of pages that are heavily annotated in all sorts of different ways. Um, you have uh, interlineation underlining, you have lots of commentary located next to passages as well as general comments um, to the side. Um, as you continue, you, you get through the summary of the chief qualities. You begin to see what qualities uh, Harvey uh, thought were perhaps most important. Um, as you can see, not unlike a first or second year student, uh, Castiglione, sorry, um, Gabriel Harvey, there's a slip, um, decides to highlight everything uh, because he wants to get an A at being a courtier. Uh, in his class. Um, here's the, um, the opening, I think, that we have on our uh, broadside, um, which has, uh, among other things, sections that are bracketed uh, that he describes as uh, no man so excellently qualified for active exercise or valorous action as indeed these qualities that he's bracketed. Um, there are others that have not been. Um, there are various and sundry of these different kinds of elements. We also see um, here where my, I don't know if you can see my, the arrow from my, my mouse, but you also see that there are different qualities of ink or writing instrument, which reflect that this document or this page was annotated on multiple occasions. So it's interesting to get students to think about how a reader read a text over time particularly where there are cross-references. Uh, and you can go from one particular passage, for example, the art of Blundeville, um, and go through the, the text, as it were. Um, and here, you, for example, you can search through the people indexed item, Thomas Blundeville, to find if there are other books in the corpus in which Blundeville appears, where that same quality of ink and writing instrument occurs, for example. An attempt to get students to at least think about how somebody um, takes different stabs at the same text. And then more importantly, one of the sort of uber comment, uh, contexts for all of this, how a reader not only read a book, but how a reader read their library and how they interacted um, with texts within their library. Um, so I'm just throwing that as kind of spaghetti on the wall, as it were, to get a conversation started about an introductory form of teaching. I wonder if one of my colleagues, Matt, perhaps you um, have some thoughts about teaching from AOR to um, first or second year undergraduates, for example. Ah, uh, I'm possibly not well uh, placed to advise on that because I have no undergraduate students. I only teach graduate students. Um, I do, however, teach an introductory lesson um, to print culture 
using AOR. There, there are two different approaches. One is, a, I generally start, as many things do, from the Livy, because usually um, I put this up against a history of reading that's with Lisa Jardine, with Tony Grafton's uh, studied for action. And then we move outwards from there through actually being able to see uh, the Livy in an interesting state. Because, of course, Earl, as you know, um, these photographs were taken before an act of conservation at Princeton Library. So we see these in a, we see this book in a, in a state that's a record of not of how the book used to be even um, six or so years ago, not as it is uh, today, beautifully uh, rebound and preserved. And then we can put this up against other online resources. I generally ask everyone to have a look. We pick bits, I pick bits, essentially like you of well-commented bits, um, and ask the students to read Livy in translation before, generally in the Loeb translation, because of course that's also available online, or at least it is at my university. Uh, and then we have breakout uh, sessions, deciding what they would add, how they would annotate this thing, according to their usual practice, how and um, what would best, what are the points that they would want to capture uh, from this text for their own interest, for their own research experiences, and then build outwards from there. It's usually quite a good session, I, I, I find, uh, or as a way into um, thinking about these things more widely. As I say, it's an introductory session for MA students, so in the very first few weeks of a postgraduate UK course. We have a number of items in the um, corpus that are um, have have particularly complex physical histories. Um, so I can return. I go to the home button and I can return to um, the sequence. Um, any number of them represent different kinds of problems. Some of those problems were problems that we faced. Um, in order to create a complex viewer that can handle lots of different problems. Um, this is the Vorka Dumia, which, um, Aaron, you asked about the physical qualities of books. Um, this is an interesting book uh, in that it's actually has a colored border with multiple colors of ink. It's a color printed uh, process. Um, and uh, it has notes um, all across it, including very specific notes um, uh, from John D, who is another one of our readers who we haven't talked about a great deal as yet, uh, including um, his, uh, his monad uh, figure here, which is a form of uh, symbolic logic. His engagement with the various figures in the text and the texts that are represented in it that sort of combine to create meaning within the physical space um, of the page. But as you proceed through the text, um, you find other pieces of information, including the British Library um, uh, information and so forth that I'm toggling here between the two. Um, you also have um, in the, the printed text, complex um, sorts of materials. So in this text, we have a different kind of material work um, I wish I could find the Cardano, but for some reason, it's just not popping out at me. Does anyone have any suggestions about why we can't? It looks find like Earl, I've, um, I've got it up, if you'd like to have a look at it. There we go. Yeah. So if you zoom into this one, if we zoom into this image, there you go you'll see um, a very interesting uh, textual engagement um, in which uh, a correction is being made to the horoscope of an individual within history. Um, Neil, I'm less familiar with the marginal note on the right. Perhaps you have something you could say about that. Yes. Um, so, I mean, D is, in this note here, commenting as he's kind of 
corrected all this. So Cardano, Cardano's book had lots of uh, sample horoscopes to tell you how these these things were to be tabulated and corrected. They also um, the book was also full of horoscopes of famous individuals. Um, this isn't one of those, but um, <clears throat> the idea was that the text would explain how it came about. And here in the margin, um, D has corrected basically the hour that this is supposed to have taken place because the year and the movements of the planets are at, at different uh, locations. So you can see the symbols that he's drawn in for the different planets, the different times. Um, and then even in here, this little J and D, um, he's added another comment basically to himself, um, guessing at why this might be the case, why this error might have occurred. Um, so you basically have um, D, in this case, talking to a book, um, talking to the author of a book through the material text, um, which is a really great example, um, both of how people interact with books, but just of how complex these interactions could be. I mean, we can decode this annotation, but very few of us, I think, except for maybe Tony, um, could tell us what it actually means um, if you just encountered it in a room. Maybe one more thing that would help people getting started, though. Um, this um, exercise here, the Libraries Without Walls on the pedagogy page, um, has a number of the pages that we were talking about that have sort of reader library interactions or specific interactions with texts. Um, so this would be a good selection of materials just to click on and start uh, a discussion about what reading and, and annotating is for, for undergraduates as well as the ones, the examples discussed above. Or, That's great, thanks a lot. No problem. Yeah, so I, I read the question about also finding uh, variations, spelling variations in nouns, for instance, and the example that was given was uh, between war, uh, the uh, customary spelling of war, W-A-R, or the um, Elizabethan spelling, which you sometimes see, W-A-R-R-E. Uh, um, and I think if you're interested in spelling variations, there are uh, yeah, different ways to, to go uh, about it. If you know, if you're interested in specific words that you um, already know, specific uh, spelling variations, um, you can, for instance, as I'm doing here now, um, just uh, use the simple search and say search for war and war. As you can see here, which will and this take a bit because it's a bit slow. Um, and here you see already in the search results, it picks up, um, the search picks up of different spellings of, uh, of the word war. The disadvantage is though, if you do this in a, in a simple basic search, um, it looks, as I explained on Monday, it doesn't only look in the, the uh, text of the marginal notes, but it, it looks in all the text associated with, with uh, every uh, single reader intervention. So if you want to narrow it down uh, a bit, what I would suggest is, for instance, use look for, for the uh, word only within the text of a marginal note, limit it to war, and you can add a term, do exactly the same, but usually other spelling uh, variant. Um, and then, as you can immediately see, you get, get lots of less uh, results because the search is, is narrowed down. Um, so that's one particular way in which I would go about um, trying to find uh, spelling variants of, of a particular word. If you want to um, broaden your search and just look for which words words might exist in the corpus with different ways of spelling it, um, you could approach it from an entirely different angle, which might be interesting as well. So if you go to the um, download data page, you can see here AOR date, um, we have made um, available various data releases um, during the project with the last and final date releases, data release uh, 5.0. Um, and in these data releases, you can find 
um, quite a lot of CSV files. These are all um, exports from the um, data as we capture them in the, in the transcriptions, in the XML files, um, including, um, as you can see here, uh, an overview of all the words which um, uh, captured in the marginalia that were written in the English language. As you can see, it's an incredibly long list and you need to do um, some work. You can order it, for instance, alphabetically. Um, column A, column B uh, signifies how often a particular word uh, uh, was mentioned in a marginal note. But if you order it alphabet, it's another way of um, finding spelling variants of, of one particular word. The only thing you then need to do is trying to uh, in within the AOR viewer, trying to find out in which book and in which particular marginal note that uh, particular word was mentioned. Um, but those are, uh, yeah, ways I would go about trying to find find uh, spelling uh, variants. And what about declined forms of of Latin nouns? Would it be similar? It would be similar, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also, I mean, I'm now showing the file for the English language. We also have a file only for uh, words that um, that we encountered in, in marginal notes that were written in Latin. Um, so that works exactly the same. You will get a similar list, but then, then Latin words and verbs and whatnot. Super, thanks a lot. If I could add one more thing here. Um, when we're searching, when we're doing simple searches for Latin words, because this is a problem that many people are many different um, programs have had with searching for Latin variants and Latin, Latin declined forms, um, we've been able to essentially piggyback on the works of others. So the software underneath that performs the search, there is a library that programs it in such a way that it knows how to deal with declined forms. And so it should bring back uh, as many different forms as humanly possible. So if you search in one instance of a Latin word, it will know well enough, or at least it knows the basics of the Latin language well enough to try to bring back as many forms of that as possible to write in your search. So it is not foolproof, but there are computational things going on under the hood that allow that to happen. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful question that we received during our uh, presentation earlier. I'm, st I'm putting up a PowerPoint slide just now. Um, uh, one of the books in our collections at Johns Hopkins that actually offers a wonderful example of how to expand the AOR corpus um, this is um, Richard Eden's annotated copy text of the first history of the New World Discovery by Peter Martyr. Um, Richard Eden translated this work, the history of Columbus's discovery of the New World and so forth. Um, this is his copy text with all of his marginalia. Um, it's a, an extraordinary book which represents um, his interpretations of the various um, uh, voyages and, uh, of Columbus there are um, marginal annotations, including drawings of islands and other things. Um, this is something that would be uh, very interesting to add, uh, in part because it also offers up um, various visual marginalia, um, as well as um, interlinear translation notes and that sort of thing. Um, there are other texts that we have in our collection. Um, for example, we have the most heavily annotated known copy of uh, Montaigne's essays in the Florio edition, published in 1613, a work that William Shakespeare, for example, quoted from. Um, it's uh, heavily annotated by Lord William Howard, a Catholic antiquary living in the north of England, and his um, antiquary, um, Nicholas Roscarek and others. And it offers a wonderful um, a array of uh, uh, marginalia uh, in English very often to an English text. Um, the problem with all of this, of course, is infrastructure. That is to say, we would have to digitize the entire book. 
um, and then have it completely uh, transcribed, encoded into XML as all the books in the AOR corpus have been. And um, subsequent to that, um, we would need to make that searchable. And we would also like to expand the corpus um, over time by integrating pedagogical components where different um, instructors um, offer the opportunity uh, to interpret uh, a chapter of uh, archaeology of reading, for example, um, through a classroom experience and to annotate the text with that, those experiences. Um, those are ideas that we have for moving forward with the archaeology of reading. But it's one thing to have sort of an idea of books to add to the corpus, but it's another to do all of that work. Um, literally, it took a team of half a dozen uh, graduate students at the Center for Editing Laws and Letters, postdoctoral fellows who were tasked like Neil before his, um, before he, um, sort of between his time at Johns Hopkins and at the University of Florida, and many others to, to do the work of transcribing, of checking, uh, and then working with technologists to integrate that material into the corpus. It's a, it's a work intensive, but also a, quite a rewarding um, uh, kind of activity. And that would involve into introducing different kinds of readers um, beyond John D and Gabriel Harvey, um, people we know because that's very useful in being able to um, do research, but also to teach, to know who's annotating and, and what sort of context from which they're annotating. But um, that's kind of a short or maybe a medium sized answer to a very large question. I think one thing we might mention more about that expansion to the site is the relationship between um, coming up with a site with a research question uh, and then gathering uh, materials for that particular research question and keeping it open to other things but then not maintaining it and not letting it become a sort of standard platform. I don't think any of us stepped into this project hoping to build something that might just be an ongoing thing where people can just upload stuff or it just becomes a repository of things. We're looking to use this to answer very particular questions. So I think one of those things we're thinking about when we're thinking about expansion in the same way, in, in, in the way that Earl was talking about earlier, we're also thinking of what effect will ha this have on our research, on these intellectual questions that we're curious in answering about the use of books, about the connecting collections of books together to form libraries. Um, I think that's something that we've got to go through quite carefully and think through quite carefully uh, as we go on, even thinking about expanding the resource as it is. Yeah, Matt, I think that's a really good point. And I also just would underscore kind of what Earl was saying about the, the time um, and the thoroughness that is required to even just get a book into the AOR corpus. Um, the XML schema that we used wasn't full TEI textual encoding initiative um, for those familiar with that, but it was close. So um, underlines became a big time consuming thing. Um, some ways it's just easier to hold up a physical book next to AOR and say, compare them um, or images um, to get started rather than the urge to put everything in to the database or the project. I think Matt might have some thoughts about the latter part of that question. Uh, again, I think this is this is allied to how we expand, to how, uh, how we get forward. Um, I well remember while we were planning the D um, extension of this project, we started with Gabriel Harvey's books and then moved on to D. Uh, many happy days uh, sitting in a, a, a library uh, with Earl and with Yarp poring over um, the, the catalog of these books and wondering what we could get hold of. Um, and what we should have uh, and what was necessary to, uh, to get. Um, I think we wanted to show a certain representative um, collection of these intellectual interests um, to show a certain amount of heavily annotated books, lightly annotated books. So it was actually quite targeted when we were putting that together. 
along with um, then working out which repository libraries uh, would be happy to work with us uh, on this. Um, and then, and, and then uh, amending our plans uh, uh, to do that. So I think if we expanded the D thing, there were negotiations uh, that have to happen intellectually. Are we overextending our representation of this of in, these interests? Uh, and also pragmatically, um, does this is this repository in a position where it could give us access to these photographs or access to these books so that we could photograph them as we did for the Royal College uh, uh, of uh, uh, Royal College here in London, uh, where we took their books in and photograph them for them, then not having their own facilities to do so. Um, can we work through these pragmatic, practical questions uh, as well before we put them online? Um, as for the, the, the suggestion of helping out with paleography, um, I, I know, and Yarp can remember as well, I'm certain, uh, days where we were just emailing things back and forth to work them out. I'm sure that there might well be mistakes and errors, um, and I will always be open to someone emailing and go, are you so sure about this? Uh, I'm, but on crowdsourcing as a way forward, um, I'm not sure how we would work that out. Although I do have, you know, we, we have talked to people on other projects who've done that, built that into their workflow in some way, such as obviously um, the initiative at the Folger Shakespeare Library, but also at UCL and our project to transcribe Bentham, uh, where we're going through all of Jeremy Bentham, the 19th century philosopher's papers, slowly transcribing all of them as well. Uh, and it does raise particular issues, I think, of how successful those things can be as an open-ended project. I would also just add that there is an editorial kind of level to this where it's very difficult to impose a kind of editorial control, particularly over polyglot materials that, I mean, some of these books literally contain marginalia in French, Italian, Latin, English, and sometimes Greek. Um, and uh, bringing different kinds of uh, levels of expertise or facility um, can be a challenge if you're trying to also create a edition, a virtual edition, as it were, of some of these works, uh, not only transcribing them, but obviously also encoding them. Um, and that requires access to, um, to, to software and to a, a, a GitHub repository and the double and triple checking of people's transcriptions, which is actually an, a part of the editorial process of AOR. What, we're, um, what I've mentioned with respect to the idea of the Montaigne of, uh, of doing a single book with uh, a massive amount of annotation is that it, once that work is done, could a, a tertiary level of annotation be introduced to the, um, to the pedagogical context of taking the transcriptions, taking the search function within an individual book, and then sort of activating that and interpreting, for example, one of the essays within a graduate seminar or a master class over a week or two, and then um, finding a way to integrate the insights and interpretations of lots of different people with different backgrounds into a, yet another feature of the viewer. Um, that may introduce an, a, a level of engagement that could be not only productive in the classroom, but also productive of scholarship. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we are hitting time. We're a few minutes over, but unless there are any other questions, then um, I'd like to thank our panelists so very much for being with us virtually. Um, and thank all of our attendees for joining us and asking good questions and for sending them in advance. That was extremely helpful. Thanks a lot. So yes, thank you again. And um, I think we're all ready to sign off. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Right, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.